Welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon, where the best ideas win. I'm your host, Josh Herring. Today, my guest is Dr. Alan Mendenhall. Dr. Mendenhall is an Associate Dean and the Grady Rosier Professor in the Sorrell College of Business at Troy University. He's also an Associated Scholar with the Ludwig von Mises Institute and the Publisher and Editor-in-Chief for Southern Literary Review. He's also the author of several books, including Writers on Writing, The Southern Philosopher, Collected Essays of John William Carrington, and Of Bees and Boys, Lines from a Southern Lawyer. Alan, welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon. Well, thanks for having me on, Josh. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's so exciting to see you in person. I know we, we crossed paths at Acton a few years ago, but otherwise I've just kind of been following your many conferences and adventures over Facebook and other, other social media, but it's great to see you again. Yeah, it's good to see you too, Josh. Well, so I, I did want to start with that. Uh, you you are uh, you at least come across my Facebook feed more than anyone else with pictures with famous. <laughs> I'm so <people>. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you you always manage to snag a picture with somebody. So I am really curious how how did that custom get started? You know, Josh, I really don't know. I I I can't recall like the first time that happened. In, but over time, I guess. You know, I just really like people. I like getting to know people. I like hearing their stories. I just did a Myers-Briggs recently and I was an ENFJ and it was like extreme extrovert. And so I, I don't know, maybe it's just, I like being around people. I like being in large crowds. I like um, talking. And so maybe it just has something to do with that. It's, I, I, I enjoy to have, I enjoy having fun with people. And, and uh, I'm sure this was just a practice that emerged from, from that aspect of my personality. I don't know. Well, it certainly seems to have taken to a lot of different things. I was looking through your CV earlier today, and you seem to bring together a bunch of different fields. Uh, you have writings in law, business, literature, and policy. Um, tell us a little bit of your story. How did you end up kind of, instead of doing the seemingly typical specialization thing, you've kind of become more of a generalist in a lot of, lot of ways. So tell us a bit about yeah. how you got there. Well, in many ways, I'm fortunate that I get to be an adamant generalist. I don't have to do the typical disciplinary specificities where you have to establish yourself in the field and write X number of peer-reviewed journals in order to get tenure. I've never really cared about chasing tenure. That's never been my goal. I have been passionate about learning and disseminating ideas, and that's my first priority. And as a lawyer, uh, I don't have to be in higher ed. I can fall back on the law. In fact, in some ways, it's a more lucrative profession than being in higher ed. But uh, so I, I, you know, I don't have to play the so-called tenure game. Where, and I get to just follow my curiosities where they lead. If I find myself reading a pattern of articles in a particular area, I will follow those interests wherever they go and write about whatever I want to write about. And, you know, it's one of those things where sometimes you, what is it, the phrase, you know, uh, I'd rather know a, a little about a lot than a lot about a little. And too many people in higher ed know a lot about a little and a little about a lot. And so I think that the breadth is, is, is a good thing for uh, academics. I think there, uh, there needs to be someone who can just sort of transcend these artificial disciplinary boundaries and speak to a wide variety of topics, not from a, the position of an expert, but from somebody who just has at least some sort of immersion in different areas. So really then all of these for you are just different passions and different interests at different points in time. That's correct. That's fascinating. I, I love that. And in part, because I think it, it fits really well with the, the guy we're talking about tonight. Uh, Richard Weaver is one of the first people that I read who uh, very conscientiously articulated the loss in the world when you get away from the medieval doctori philosophi as the one who can, who has mastered as much as you can ever master them, uh, but who has mastered the liberal arts and can see the unity of knowledge. And that I found that vision captivating. I'm pretty sure he articulates that in both Ideas Have Consequences and Visions of Order, uh, but it's certainly something that seems to be lost in our, our modern day. So I, I'm, I'm really excited to, I always enjoy talking with folks who, who know about a wide variety of things and kind of bring those together. 
Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, I, I agree with you about, about Weaver. I mean, he celebrated sort of the feudal version of society uh, and the code of chivalry and the concept of the gentleman. And, uh, you know, in some ways, he favored a, a medieval Christian uh, society with uh, all, you know, all the, the community and the rootedness to the land that that would entail. So he's, he's an interesting throwback, I'd say. Not necessarily, in his own era, he was just, you know, he was, he was a contemporary of, of the Southern agrarians, um, but, uh, but the Southern agrarians themselves were a bit of a, a throwback to sort of romantic, um, the romantic periods of um, medievalism and the, the legends of Arthur and his knights and all of that. Oh, that's certainly true. And though, oddly enough, I always find it fascinating. And uh, Weaver cast such an alluring vision that he didn't himself live terribly well. I mean, he, as far as I understand it, he lived out of a hotel room in Chicago for many years and would make an, an annual trip back to Weaverville to the family home. He, uh, family actually, reunion, uh, basically. Yeah. Annual family reunion. And he would give talks, little lectures at the family reunion. And that would, if people, I mean, that was sort of a CV for him. You know, I gave my lecture at the, at the family reunion because they were academic talks. I mean, my family reunions aren't like this, but, but his apparently involved like sort of high, high level discussions. Oh my goodness. Well, I, I, I guess, I mean, I've never really thought about his family, but I, I suppose they must have, his, his intellectual interest must have grown out of something that was already there in his family, presumably. It could have been that, or it could have been like, oh, here goes Uncle Richard again. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, that, that, so tell us a bit more about uh, Richard Weaver and uh, particularly his book, Southern Tradition at Bay. I know uh, we ended up connecting over your recent review of that in uh, Liberty Fund's journal, Law and Liberty. Uh, so yeah. walk us through that book and why did Regnery decide to republish this book from the 1950s? Why republish that in 2021? Okay, well, I'll try to take those one piece at a time. First on who was Richard Reaver. I mean, Richard Reaver was principally an English professor in, at the University of Chicago. He was a rhetorician, really. Um, he uh, had earned a bachelor's at the University of Kentucky. He uh, did a master's degree in English at Vanderbilt University, which is where John Crow Ransom was, among others. John Crow Ransom supervised his master's thesis. He taught at Auburn University and at Texas A&M briefly. And by the way, those two teams just played each other in SEC football this weekend uh, <laughs> with a result that was not to my liking. Um, and then Weaver uh, went and got a doctorate from LSU. And at that time, uh, Clanth Brooks and Robert Penn Warren were there, as, as was Eric Vogelin. And he actually did his dissertation under Clanth Brooks. And that dissertation was titled The Confederate South, 1865 to 1910, with the subtitle of A Study in the Survival of a Mind, uh, of a mind and a Culture. And that dissertation is the book you just mentioned. And it was published posthumously but uh, at times when you're reading the, the Southern tradition at bay, you might find yourself wondering what the focus is and why I really wish that the, uh, that the publishers uh, at Arlington, I guess it was at the time, had retained that dissertation title because it would have clarified what Southern tradition Weaver was referring to. I mean, he was chiefly referring to or white Southern culture in the 11 states that had made up the Confederacy. Had that clarification been there, I think, um, you know, there would be less complaint about, well, Weaver doesn't define the South here. Weaver's not telling you what geographical boundaries and regional specificities we're dealing with. Well, he's not because that was all, that was all in the title and, <laughs> and you didn't need to look anywhere else. You just sort of knew that, okay, by South, this is what he means. He's talking about these uh, particular, um, states and, 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 uh, and the regions contained within them. But the, uh, the book essentially argues uh, that the, uh, the main argument of the Southern tradition at bay is that the South is a distinct civilization or culture. But I think civilization is the term that uh, is, is critical here because uh, it is something more than just a culture. It is uh, it, a culture is just a part 
of civilization. All of the institutions that follow from culture are involved in a civilization. And, um, and what, Re what Weaver is really trying to do is define the South during the periods uh, specified in that, um, and, and, and that subtitle, the, the, those, those, those years that, that, frame, um, that frame his, um, the frame the period that he's trying to discuss. And it's an interesting argument because at times you think that Weaver is being merely descriptive, but then he will color things in a way that make, makes you sort of wonder whether he is um, letting his own approval or disapproval, as the case may be, shine through. That sounds so similar to what he does in Ideas Have Consequences. I mean, where, I mean, just like there's, there'll be paragraph after paragraph of description, but then he'll land it on just a key poignant sentence that seems so applicable, but he doesn't do that very, uh, he doesn't do that preacher thing where he'll say, and now my first application point is, he doesn't do that. He just fits it right, right. in with the descriptive. Right. And it's a very literary way of writing as well. Um, but we know from sort of his other talks that, and, and, and other writings that some of the things that he celebrates in, in, in those, he also identifies in this dissertation. So keep in mind, this, this is a dissertation. So it's got that uh, it's that medium with that particular audience in mind. So he's not going to let his own personal predilections come through too much. But we know from other writings that, you know, the, the way he talks about uh, Southern traditions and the way he sort of rails against uh, science and industry and uh, even capitalism and central power suggests that uh, the ideas that he identifies with the South in the Southern tradition at bay he agrees with. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit more about those, because I think it, it's, I, I suspect that for mo most of our audience, uh, assuming this episode has some listeners, but uh, most of our audience has probably not read much of Weaver, and they probably also don't run into very many people today who conscientiously advocate appreciating the Old South. And I think Weaver is one of those places that I appreciate him sounding that kind of minority view. I think most folks today want to look at the old South and they begin with condemning the South for the obviously inhumane practice of slavery. But Weaver doesn't do that. He, he seems to start with, I mean, the, the things that come to my mind without having read this particular book are, uh, he talks about uh, kind of a slower pace of life, being more attuned to the seasons. And there's, I assume something of his views about distinction and hierarchy probably come in. But, but tell us a bit more, what, what did Weaver appreciate about Southern culture that he thought was, was worth recognizing? Well, so Weaver was disenchanted with industrialism and commodity culture and believed that the busyness and materialism of the American way of life had deprived us of something spiritual as human beings. And he felt that a return to the more agrarian way of life had a uh, localizing or a um, sort of unifying force to it. And so he identified with the Southern tradition as a place that was local, that was rooted, that had an organic growth to it, that could trace its lineage back to uh, uh, old Europe that had continuity to it. And, you know, he, he was somebody that really uh, would not have liked conservatism as it was expressed from say 1960s, around the time of his death really, and, and up through the Reagan era and up recent, until, re until recent years really that sort of embraced free markets and, um, and, and uh, you know, uh, open economies and, and, and things such as that, that, that wasn't really his, his view of conservatism. And he was a, a, a conservative and wrote for conservative publications and identified as a conservative later in life. He was a socialist actually as an undergraduate before coming to uh, some of these views. And uh, sort of like a Eugene Genovese who was a Marxist who himself identified uh, a lot of uh, economics 
in uh, the Southern agrarian ways that he uh, admired. But you're right to identify sort of the, the natural hierarchy as being part of his, his view. Um, I think he also was somebody who despised political abstractions. He was something mm -hmm. of a realist and said that, uh, you know, the, the North was something that was represented by Thomas Paine or somebody that's going to give you rhetorical flourishes about grand abstractions and sort of radical innovations and newness, whereas the South was the doctrine of Edmund Burke and gradualism and incrementalism and rootedness and human fallibility and the organic nature of society and all of these sorts of things. And so uh, if you're thinking about it in terms of like Vogelin or Kirk, you know, it, uh, Weaver fits right in as somebody that's going to warn against totalizing abstractions or working towards ideals that had no concrete basis in reality. These were dangerous things to him. And uh, as a historian, he saw that uh, all of our current conditions are necessarily evolved from previous conditions and that there is always uh, a line of thought or um, things that can be traced back. And he wanted to discover what, where do things come from was not somebody who was looking forward to the unknown or championing things that hadn't been tested or tried. He was, in that respect, something of a fallibilist, somebody who wanted to rely on the uh, information and data that had been given to us through the centuries, rather than somebody that wanted to carve out something entirely new, like, an, you know, even Emerson, you know, he, 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 he was always looking back to, you know, poor Poor old wine into new wineskins, but uh, a lot of those transcendentalists were not. They wanted to carve out something radically new and distinguish the United States or America in their, their, their view of the America from, from the old view of Europe. And, and that was not the way of Weaver. I think that is really intriguing. Uh, would you connect him to Wendell Berry at all? Sure. I think, I mean, I think Wendell Berry is, is, is sort of a, a great example of somebody who, uh, whether wittingly or unwittingly, has inherited uh, Weaver's principles and uh, modes of thinking, absolutely. And I should say, Weaver was not just uncritical of the South. He, he, criticized, uh, he criticized aspects of, of Southern culture. In particular, he thought that Southerners were a little bit too Philistine, that they didn't develop great cultural taste. And I think he was irritated that uh, Southerners always tried to defend themselves by legal and constitutional arguments rather than by literary or philosophical expression. And that it had, they, had they argued through imaginative literature, they would have had a more compelling or captivating story. I, that, that is a, oh man, what a, what a world that would have been. I mean, I can't even, I have trouble even imagining what that imaginative literature would have been. I mean, or, or what that, a, what, unless, well, I take, I take that back. Well, I mean, you know, it's before the, he, yeah, because yeah, the period he's covering is before the Southern Renaissance. And then you get the Southern Renaissance and you get all kinds of figures emerging and, and you know, most notably William Faulkner. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, so really, so if, if Faulkner or Flannery O'Connor had been perhaps a century or maybe 150 years earlier, Weaver would have looked at someone of their that ilk to kind of be the 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 poet prophet of Southern culture. Yeah, and I think he, you know, the, I think he would have thought someone like William Gilmore Sims or something was 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 sort of the sumum bonum of Southern literary culture. But he was underappreciated because it was just the general uh, the general Southern culture that did not. Uh, appreciate the the letters as much. It wasn't that we just completely lacked those minds. It was that we were just you know too um, um, too enthralled with uh, political and constitutional arguments. It was a you know people were going to look to John C. Calhoun to make his uh, his legal and political arguments before they would look to a Sims or something like that. Well, that's really interesting. That okay. 
which I think is just, uh, uh, perhaps it's self ironic that Weaver ends up spending most of his adult life in Chicago, far away from from yeah, the agrarian true. South. But that's true. And he, by the way, he didn't have very many friends either. He sort of lived <laughs> a lonely, isolated life. It, uh, it was, uh, he. I, I, I went through a, a, a bit of a crisis in uh, loving Weaver, and then uh, I ran into Brad Berzer at uh, a conference a couple years ago, right after he finished writing his biography of Russell Kirk. And Berzer told me some stories about Weaver's personal life that I was just like, I couldn't quite square with the man I thought I had been reading and appreciating. It, well, it was my own moment to realize that like, the ideas can be true, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to emulate everything that this guy believes. <laughs> and if there's that much dissonance, then I need to go back and consider maybe there is something about, maybe there's a reason we shouldn't all be Neoplatonists. I mean, <laughs> there's some, there's some <laughs> there. Yeah. And I, you know, that, I think that goes for a lot of intellectuals, whether they advocate conservative ideas or not. You know, sometimes you know, intellectuals living the life of the mind tend to separate themselves from uh, the... Now, you mentioned earlier, um, you connected Weaver to uh, Vagling and Kirk, and I wonder, uh, I, I've thought for years that Weaver kind of sits in between them as a stylist. So just, just as a writer, they're like, Kirk is very popular in his writing. He's very accessible. Vagelin is almost impenetrable. And then there's Weaver who sits just in the middle with these beautiful, complex sentences that I can understand if I spend long enough on them. Would, would you agree with that analysis or how, how would you describe them? No, I think that's accurate. And remember, we, Weaver was a rhetorician. So he liked to arrange his sentences in unique and creative ways. And he could turn a phrase and he could say what you and I would say in a very simple sentence in a more complex way, but in a very uh, rhetorically delightful way. I don't know how else to put it. He, uh, he had an ear for the musicality of language and was able to capture things like alliteration and assonance mm. and to do things with commas that make you sort of pause. It was rhetorical acrobatics in a lot of ways, but uh, it wasn't complex, not, not, not complex at all. It was, you know, simple, simple sentences, but just very well put. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could shift uh, maybe perhaps away from Weaver's vision of the South to a discussion of the South today. Uh, yeah. so as as a scholar of Southern literature and a, a uh, and at least if I understand it, you're, you're you're in Alabama currently, right? I am. Yes, oh. I've lived in Alabama since 2013, but I was born and raised in Georgia. Had family ties to Alabama. Well, so as a long a, a lifelong uh, uh, liver in the South, um, what tell give me your thoughts on the South in the 21st century? Is there still a discernible Southern culture? Is it a meaningful thing to call oneself a Southerner? What, what, what are your thoughts on that today? Well, I think the answer is yes, but I do think the uh, distinctiveness of Southern culture is diminishing. But when I just try to come up with like a list, let's say, of, of things that are sort of unique to the South, they're not totally unique to the South. I mean, people do them in other regions, but they are um, huge in the South. And it's, you know, anything from, you know, uh, distinct cuisine. I mean, we we eat grits and fried chicken and collard greens, and you know we do this all the time, and we love doing this. And we watch college football. I mean, college football is sort of a reenactment of of war right there. I mean, it sort of comes right out of the Civil War. You've got one side on, and you know the other side. They line up in their offensive or defensive positions. They march forward. They get into one field zone or the other field zone, and it's just uh, it's just sort of manufactured warfare. Uh, it's the South remains a conservative region for the most part. Uh, it still has large pockets of uh, the Bible Belt and evangelical culture. Um, it's got country music, jazz music, soul music, um, and these are things that whites and blacks and Hispanics all share. Uh, it's a it's a place where. Fishing and hunting are the uh, extracurricular activities of rich and poor. Doesn't matter how rich you are in the South, you're gonna go hunt or fish. Doesn't matter how poor you are in the South, you're gonna go hunt and fish. It's got a distinct architecture. Uh, the Atlanta Braves for a long time were the only baseball team down here. Congrats to them for winning the World Series this year. Um, NASCAR, golf, uh, golf is popular because of the warm climate year round. 
politics. Everybody seems to be obsessed with politics. And although <laughs> I would say manners are on the decline in the South, in particular in the urban centers, I think decorum and manners are still uh, important to many people, in particular in Christian communities, but also in uh, more of the rural uh, areas of uh, different states in the, in the Southeast. That is a, that's quite the list. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what those have in common. That's the thing is, <laughs> I, I don't know how to tie them all together, but uh, I find it interesting because, you know, the, the South still has this reputation for being, uh, for being, you know, racist or for struggling with race relations. And the South is actually the most diverse region of the country by far and uh, has a vast African-American population, has a vast Hispanic population, has a vast Native American population, and a lot of other uh, immigrants coming in. And uh, the, the, the new migration was this phenomenon in the 70s and 80s and 90s and continuing on today where uh, African-Americans have in mass moved back to the South as uh, cities have deindustrialized, as you know, the Midwest has uh, started dwindling in numbers and as industry begins to leave manufacturing and other sort of jobs that were popular in like a Detroit or a Pittsburgh or, you know, any of those sort of manufacturing towns. And uh, African-Americans are moving in large numbers to the South. And millennials in particular are coming to Texas and Georgia and Florida and North and South Carolina. And uh, the demographic ch shifts are changing. And, uh, but nevertheless, there still seems to be a, uh, a, a, a fixed part of Southern culture, because all these communities have in common uh, Christianity, for one. I, I think that, uh, you know, Hispanics bring a, a more Catholic uh, tradition than what was traditionally Protestant among whites and blacks in the South, but they all bring a Christian culture. They're all uh, sort of fundamentally conservative at root, regardless of whether they vote for Democrats or Republicans. They they tend to, um, you know, stress traditional family units. I know fatherlessness is a particular problem in, in the African American community, but the ideal of family and uh, you know family reunions and the importance of the family unit, those are all tremendously um, uh, characteristic of of, of African American communities in the South. And so I think that uh, that race relations in the South are in many ways. Uh, better than they are in other regions of the country, but for um, stereotypes that continue to persist in popular media and for political reasons, because the South has the most red states and the media tends to lean left, um, you'll see media targeting the, the, the few incidents that happen that are sort of, uh, of rightly so, of national, uh, uh, worthy of national attention. You, you see those, whereas those things may go on in other regions of the country and not and not receive the same degree of scrutiny. Sure. Uh, no, that, that, that's certainly true. And there's, I remember, I mean, I'm thinking the one that comes to my mind immediately is the, uh, the, the shooting in the church in Charleston a couple of years back. I mean, they're just, that was, that was certainly a tragic moment uh, for, for that community. Uh, it certainly did, did rise to national attention, uh, though. Uh, I'll just take a quick moment to uh, point out that at least as of uh, November 8th on 2021, when we are recording, uh, the same media that reported extensively on that has ignored uh, pretty much all of the uh, moments of persecution of the church in communist China. That that has gone basically ignored, and it is a massive, massive human rights violation. Uh, but that's really a tangent. That, that, that really doesn't have a whole lot to do with what we were uh, discussing. I was like, as you were describing that, I wonder, uh, I was remi it reminded me of a section in Ideas Have Consequences where Weaver talks about culture existing on three levels. As the lowest level is sort of the, uh, the ability to trust in other people that they will keep their word. And that's sort of what requires us, that's necessary for basic economic interaction. But then there's a secondary level above that that's operating on the level of ideas that we share common ideas and we're able to kind of participate in higher levels of cooperation. But he talks about the uh, largest level of culture being, uh, his phrase was the metaphysical dream, that for men to cooperate together in a culture, they have to share in this ultimate vision of kind of the, uh, of really the, 
I mean, in a, in a very platonic sense of like the nature of the forms and the nature of ideas. And that from that, then we get all those lower concerns are kind of ranked in relation to the higher. I wonder from your description, it almost sounds like a sort of ill-defined Christian conservatism might be the metaphysical dream of the South that holds all those pieces together. Does that fit? I think, or I think no? that fits. I think that fits. And of course, you know, different communities can can point to different um, you know, different biblical texts or different biblical traditions to place their emphasis. I mean, you know, obviously ideals of, of, of equality um, and justice uh, are, are central to certain communities, whereas other communities are going to emphasize other things. I mean, even, even the pros I mean, prosperity gospel teachings are, are, are prominent. Joel Osteen's right down there in Texas too. You know? So these are all different, you know, different directions that people are taking their Christianity, but you're right that, that, that at heart, the metaphysics behind, um, the, the metaphysics that might underlie this or you, unite all of this is, is essentially Christian. Yeah, well, uh, as a kind of a, a last question about the South, I, uh, yeah. do you think Southern culture will really be able to continue being some sort of ill-defined homogenous thing? I mean, like you, you referenced it a moment ago, there's been so much movement into the South. Uh, I'm thinking of two areas in particular. Uh, and uh, the state of Texas picked up a new congressional district in the, the last census, primarily from people moving from California and New York. Uh, then my own area of Raleigh, North Carolina, just displaced Austin, Texas as the uh, best new city to live in for millennials in 2020. So in these kind of changing demographics, do you think Southern culture is going to continue to exist and be transferred to from one generation to the next? Or is it, is it going to go the way of other cultures as it's displaced through population change? Well, I'm not... You know, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I tend to think that all cultures get repurposed and re-expressed from generation to generation. And I don't think you ever entirely lose a culture in at least residual form. So some manifestation of Southern culture will continue to be with us. But I find that people moving to the South, a lot of them, I mean, and it is, population is exploding. Things are going well down here. Things are pretty good. You know, our economy is picking up we we were not uh a locking down during covid and we we you know life life is is improving in the south and uh and it's declining in a lot of other places and i find that a lot of people that i meet who are moving from places like new york and new jersey are coming here to escape those places they want to get out of those places they don't want to be there and they're they're looking for places to go that fit their beliefs and 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 what they you know, their quality of life, and they're finding it down in the South. And so I find that, uh, interestingly enough, Southern culture is, uh, is, is being preserved, but not necessarily by Southerners. It's, it's by people who are coming here, because they appreciate those ways of life, uh, ways of life, and maybe are embracing it more passionately than people who took it for granted, because they just lived here and grew up here. Um, so I do think that Southern culture, it, it, you know, I don't know what, what, it, what it necessarily will look like, but I do think it will uh, persist in, in, in some form. And I actually think it's starting to flourish and, and thrive, but in some ways, having shed the bad stuff, I, I feel as if, you know, a, a lot of uh, the racism and, um, and, and all the badges and legacies of slavery that burdened the South for so long, while the, that while they are um, definitely still here are way less severe um, than they used to be. And in particular among, you know, these Gen Z and millennial people, I mean, it, it's just a totally different. I went to a, a big pro-life banquet last week, uh, last week and I, I, the room was maybe 60, 40 white, black, and everyone was together. And, you know, mm. it, it, it just shows, you know, a, a pro-life position is not a Democratic Republican issue down here in Alabama, right here at the state level. It might be when the national political parties and all the corporations start coming in with all their money and trying to disrupt things. But right here on the local level, you go to a, a you go to a, a, a pro life banquet in Montgomery, Alabama, and you're going to see blacks, whites, Hispanics all there, all um, in support of 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 
uh, pro-life causes, and in particular, in this case, I'm, I'm thinking of a particular organization. But uh, you know, those those categories that we're taught to think in and by the the media: Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. You know, a lot of our our, our sort of cultural conservatism in the South cuts across those labels mm. in ways that complicate them, and uh, the media. You know, the media is sort of asinine at, <laughs> these days, and there's there's no good way to tell tell those kinds of stories um, uh, in in a sound bite. Of course, uh, I think it's so interesting, or uh, I feel like I've used the word interesting or maybe ironic several times tonight, but uh, yeah. ironic fits here. That the the side that uh, if if we look at politics kind of in a polarized position that the the side that claims to be the position of tolerance has actually ended up embracing a lot more institutional racism in various capacities. I just uh, just last week I was at a, uh, a dinner with the uh, the James Martin Center for Academic Excellence. They hosted uh, Gail Hero to speak about the problems of race-based admissions in higher ed. And these are the very colleges and universities that have trumpeted diversity and tolerance that have themselves embraced a sort of tacit racism in their admissions, while at the same time you have the opposite side that is characterized as being racist, uh, actually looking at the foundations of the human person and human dignity and creating the conditions for uh, people to really come together around true convictions and come together in a beautiful plurality. Oh, I think that's a that's that's a great sign for for our republic for sure. That that's that's what you're seeing in, in Alabama. Well, and it's one of the beauties of Christianity is that, the, I mean, fundamentally, the belief that all humans are created in God's image mm -hmm. and that all are uh, inherently um, fallen and that we are all sinners in need of grace. And that is a beautiful concept. It doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. We're all uh, in need of God's grace and we're all created with that same human dignity, no matter who we are, no matter what we look like. And no matter how bad we are, we're all forgivable. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, Alan, before, before we close, uh, I've got three last questions for you. Uh, first of those, uh, what are you writing currently? I know you, you have, uh, your CV had the line of hundreds of articles published in lots <laughs> of places. So I'm sure you have something uh, in, in the pipeline currently. Well, you mentioned the Martin Center. They actually emailed me today and said, hey, where's that book review we're waiting on? So I've got to get a book review to the Martin Center. I'm writing a piece for uh, Law and Liberty on a new university that's uh, going to launch in, in Austin, Texas. I'm sure you'll hear about it within the coming days. I, uh, I, 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 I've got a book that technically it came out in September, but we're in the middle of a supply chain crisis. And so my delivery date is like December 23rd for this what? thing. <laughs> I just want to hold my new book, Josh. I just want to hold it in my hands and it won't come. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, what, what is your new book? Because by the time this episode airs, it'll be sometime in January or February. So hopefully- Oh, good. Out. So somebody oh. might actually buy it. Well, it's, uh, it, it's uh, Shouting Softly, Lines on Law, Literature, and Culture, and it's St. Augustine's Press. And uh, I had actually submitted the manuscript to them during COVID and they said, and I'd submitted it as, you know, with the title of the collected works of Alan Mendenhall, collected essays of Alan Mendenhall. And they said, you know what, we really like these essays, but you're not famous. So we're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to publish collected works. We realize that you're just trying to republish a bunch of essays that you've already published in book form. So why don't you take the manuscript back and work on it and get it to us by August, 2020. And we want you to separate the sections into law, literature, and culture, separate the essays that way. We want you to synthesize them so they're, they're no longer just these little standalone essays. We want you to, to tie them together, add to them, make them more robust, work on them. So it took a long time. So what was due in August 2020 actually got submitted in August 2021. I'm just so glad that the editors there at St. Augustine Press were just very, very patient with me and gave me and a year long extension on my deadline. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see it come out too. It's got a big bow tie on the cover, which I was excited. I didn't choose that. Somebody else chose that. It's perfect. Uh, I think you, you, you have quite, you must have quite the collection of bow ties because I think in most pictures <laughs> I've seen, you're wearing a different bow tie. <laughs> I have a lot of bow ties and a lot of ties. Oh, there we go. What are you reading right now? Well, I can actually tell you, oh, they're not on my, they're not on my desk, but I've got the, the new uh, Sally Rooney novel. I, I, 
I wanted to figure out why everyone referred to her as a millennial author. You know, she's this Irish author that, that uh, writes these books on relationships. And I just was curious, like, what is it about this person that, that makes, makes her a, a millennial author? So that's, I, I, I decided just to pick up a novel and, and, and read through that. Um, I've got a long list of books to get through. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm teaching, <laughs> teaching a class that's on, 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 on leadership and I'm having to go through this leadership textbook that's uh, that, that's not quite the way I would I, I would write one. I, I went to an Aspen Institute seminar in August, and we did you know it was a leadership executive seminar, and we did it with great books text, and it was absolutely wonderful. So I think that I will be reworking my syllabus in subsequent semesters to tailor it toward that sort of pedagogical approach. I, I think these great books texts they. You know they they continue to teach they continue to to um, withstand the test of time and there's a reason for it they generate conversation and discussion and that's really what you want to do in a classroom that's it and and no uh, no no uh, no shame to excellent professors uh, but there there is something about a class that is centered on great text and where the professor really kind of sets up the access to the text and then the great the students go to it and it's all this big collaborative we're learning together moment uh that does, there's there's nothing that quite beats that that's um, true and you can get to the same sort of leadership principles that way as you could going through the leadership textbook <laughs> uh fantastic uh well alan lastly where can listeners find and follow your work online I guess, Josh, the easiest way is probably just my website, which is just myname.com. So alanmindenhall.com, that's probably the easiest way. I mean, you can follow my, uh, my, my, my Twitter and Facebook posting by looking at those pages, but it gets out of control. I've got, I've got this long list of, of websites I go through every morning here, Josh. You can see, I, I, I put them up. And I go through every single one of these publications every morning to see what each one has published that's new that day. And I, I tend to focus on arts and culture and just, I, I tweet what I read and it's, it, it's become a, a habit that I can't break. I wake up every morning feeling obligated to get on there and post all those articles. Well, I, I, for one, appreciate you doing that. Um, I usually see those on, on Facebook. I, I'm still getting back into using Twitter, mostly for this podcast, but... Uh, I know, Richard Weaver would hate us, wouldn't he? he oh, would he would. He would say, we just need to abandon the internet. So, uh, we need to go, like, move to a monastery or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I can't tell you how many of the articles you've shared out I found really helpful. So they, I, I appreciate your habit. It's it's very beneficial. Oh, well, thanks. I, I never know if people like it or hate it, but this is a lot enough people will tell me that they like it, that I'll keep doing it. Well, there we go. Uh, well, Alan, thank you so much for joining us here on the Optimistic Curmudgeon. This has been a great conversation. Well, thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Well, listeners, uh, thank you for joining myself, Josh Herring, and my guest, Dr. Alan Mendenhall, today for another episode of the Optimistic Curmudgeon. If you like this episode, please do leave us a five-star review wherever you watch this show or listen to the podcast and share it with your friends. Until next time, seek the good, discover the true, and love the beautiful. You've been listening to another conversation on The Optimistic Curmudgeon. If you like what you've heard today, please leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcasting platform. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at optimisticcurmudgeon2021 at gmail.com. You can find us on all major social media sites. I'll list three. Uh, we're on Twitter at OptimisticC3, on Instagram at OptimisticCurmudgeon2021, and Facebook at Facebook.com slash the-optimistic-curmudgeon. You can find our show notes, guest bios, and all episodes stored on our website, OptimisticCurmudgeon.org. Until next time, seek the good, love the true, and pursue the beautiful.